All right. Hello, everyone. Uh, it is 2 o'clock, so we will go ahead and get started. Uh, welcome to The Current, the North Central Region Water Network Speed Networking Webinar Series. My name is Ann Nardi. I am the Marketing and Communications Specialist for the North Central Region Water Network, and I'll be your facilitator for today's session. We're excited about today's webinar. We have a, a great uh, lineup of speakers who are going to be talking about a regional youth water education needs assessment. This is actually a uh, North Central Region Water Network funded team, the youth water education team, who's going to be talking about their work uh, doing a needs assessment of the North Central Region Water Network, or excuse me, of the North Central Region and the youth water needs in that area. Uh, before we get started, just a few housekeeping items for you. Uh, we will be having a dedicated Q&A session after our speakers present. We all have three speakers today. Uh, so if you would like to submit your questions for the presenters via the chat box, we will go through that in a facilitated Q&A after each of our speakers present. The chat box is accessible via the purple Collaborate panel in the lower right-hand corner of your screen. If you are having issues with audio at all today, uh, a phone-in option can be accessed by opening the session menu in the upper left area of your webinar screen and selecting the use phone for audio uh, option. Um, and this session today will be recorded for uh, uh, anyone who's not able to attend today and will be posted on the North Central Region Water Network's website and our website and our uh, webinar archive as well as on learn.eextension.org. So we have a great lineup of speakers for you today. As I mentioned, this is the network's youth water education team presenting their work on a regional needs assessment in the North Central region on youth water education. So our three speakers are three members of that youth uh, water education working group or team, uh, Justin Hoffman of the University of Wisconsin-Madison, Christy Lakeys of The Ohio State University, and Zuzana Borovka of The Ohio State University and The Ohio Water Resources Center. So to get us started, we're going to hear from Justin first. Uh, Justin is an associate professor at the University of Wisconsin-Madison at Division of Extension, and he's also the director of Upham Woods Outdoor Learning Center located in Wisconsin Dells, his, uh, in Wisconsin Dells, Wisconsin. His bio is there for you. I won't read the whole thing, but you're happy to, you're welcome to look at it and review. Uh, and with that, I will go ahead and hand it over to Justin. Thanks a lot, Ann. Um, this um, next couple slides here, uh, I'm intending to introduce the background behind this work and how we came to select it as a team, as a um, project that we wanted to focus our time on. Um, the um, um, that team is a multi-state team, and you can and I <laughs> I won't uh, read all these names here, but you can get a sense pretty quickly here of the geographic variety of um, or geographic distribution of the folks in the north central region um, that were involved in this and all these folks were a part of generating the, um, the project proposal or um, refining the questions or analyzing the data or helping us um, get data collected from um, most of these states So um, how did we arrive here? I, um, it, was a, it was several years ago um, in a, in a uh, mini conference with the North Central region uh, that there was a subset of folks looking at um, water resources and water issues, particularly with youth. And um, um, you know, through that time and round tables and different um, you know, big stickies on the wall, uh, and looking at where we have opportunities and where we have gaps, you know, it became clear that um, this region uh, would benefit from looking at that gap and defining it really well before we, we went about designing any new curriculum or any new uh, services. So um, we wondered um, what, you know, what was that current state of water education as it related to our different roles in extension. And then these other two ideas of opportunities and need fall out of that. Um, so something is already happening. Let's connect A to B 
and be efficient, or um, there's A and C, and we need to define what B is so we can create it or um, uh, look for it or write a grant to build it. And we needed this data set to generate it. And um, this is, you know, a really high level, uh, you know, oversimplification of it, but we wanted to ask these questions um, around the region, gather that information, and ultimately want to get it to some action. And that action would be use of existing curriculum or generation of um, new materials that um, serve a need. Um, so a status and needs um, assessment is something that, in, in when I introduced this idea to the team, um, I used the example that we have in, in Wisconsin for this approach. Um, we, we're you know, taking kind of a census of what's out there so that we have data that can inform what we do next, how we you know, adapt to um, what's changing on the landscape or um, changing demographically, and ultimately enhance uh, uh, the quality of EE. And surely, we all know uh, we've been teaching about environmental education and water for generations, but what's going to make it successful today and what's going to make it successful tomorrow um, are very different things than what, um, what might have been working in the years past. So again, this is just a small little case study about Wisconsin. I'll briefly talk about and then get into the um, bigger project with Christy. So in Wisconsin, for example, you know, we do an analysis like this every couple of years. In the, um, 2019, we had run our third round of this to over 700 orgs. And what that produces, um, you know, and almost 200 respondents from organizations about what types of things they're looking for. And that really helps us target um, the needs um, that these organizations have and and our ability to describe those organizations really helps um, connect to publication and connect to funding opportunities. So um, again, this is kind of a mini case study of just one of the states, but this is um, uh, what we started from when we looked at the gap analysis. And um, this last slide is just about the potential that, um, that we have when we look at this issue at a large scale. So, if I look at water issues just as up on woods, and my 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 work as a faculty member is a small um, drop in the bucket, so to speak. But if we zoom out to the state, we realize you know this is a part of a forty million dollar industry and you know thousands of employees. Well, that's relevant um, to stakeholders and um, elected officials, but it's also relevant in describing what we're doing if we have a projected project at a regional level. So. Um, Part of the intent was to begin to populate information at a multi-state level that is similar to the way we can describe a state's need. And um, that's what this um, project uh, was intended to uh, scaffold. And so from a global context, there's a big need um, to address the risk um, that we are facing for clean water, both in its quantity and quality. And um, these are some of the um, initiating premises that we put into the proposal um, for the North Central region to address um, our water education needs. Um, and again, to wrap that up, um, the, um, you know, what's out there already, what, um, what are new ways to approach it and connect it to the landscape, and ultimately, you know, what emerging issues or emerging um, demographics or perspectives might um, inform better engagement um, on down the road. And so again, that's a, this next slide's a reiteration of that in our proposal. All right, great. Thank you, Justin. Uh, now we're going to hand it over to Christy Lakeys. Christy Lakeys is an associate professor in the School of Environment and Natural Resources and an Extension State Specialist with The Ohio State University. And she's going to be talking a little bit more about methods, samples, and start to get into some of those results of the needs assessment. So uh, I will turn it over to Christy. All right, thank you. And good afternoon, everyone. So nice to be with you. Just as a reminder, um, here is a map of the North Central region. We have 12 states in the region. 
And our, again, our goal was to learn about youth water education and to, to be able to then give people some ideas of what can be done in all of the states and, and beyond these 12 states. So the study, which we actually conducted in 2018 and then continued to analyze our data into 2019, is it, it consisted of two different parts, what we called tier one and tier two. So tier one was that we wanted to first survey people in extension, so extension educators, specialists, and program assistants to find out what extension was doing. And then tier two was to learn from community organizations and partners. What are some of the efforts that they're doing? And, and to learn as much as we could about youth water education. We, we were hoping to get a good representation of programs. We knew we couldn't possibly reach every single program in all of the 12 states. But the idea was that we could get at least a good idea of different kinds of things that were happening. So for Tier 1, the extension personnel, what we did was we had developed an online survey and we then distributed the survey primarily to agricultural, agriculture and natural resource listservs, and then also to some 4-H listservs, newsletters, any way that we could get this information out to people in extension who might be doing some kind of youth water education. And then we had asked people to please forward the survey on to other people who they know who are doing youth water education. And then for Tier 2, which followed right after we finished with Tier 1, we had asked the Extension folks if they knew of anyone or organizations in their area that were providing youth water education. So that gave us some contact information. We could contact those programs directly. We also then tried to identify other organizations so website searches, listservs that we were familiar with, programs we were familiar with, and then again asking people to forward the survey on to others so that we could try to get as much information as possible. And so in this group, we reached some nature centers, soil and water conservation districts, and then a broad range of environmental education programs. So for the survey, we had taken quite a bit of time to develop questions, trying to get at the relevant information that would be helpful to us and help inform future efforts in youth water education. So we had a mix of open and closed end questions. And these are just some of the topics that we covered on and that we'll focus on today. But who are they serving, for example? What age, what grade levels? Where are they providing youth water education? What kind of curriculum is being used? What kind of um, importance do they place on state education or other education standards? What are things that really excite young people about wa youth water education that they've observed? What are some barriers? What are missing pieces to what they're doing? And then seeing some examples of some positive impacts. So then just to share some information with you, first of all, who was part of this study. So we were able to reach 230 extension professionals, so educators, some state specialists, and program assistants, and people in various capacities within extension. And so we were able to find people from nine different states who responded to the survey. And we have a mix of states here in the not from the nine states. And Primarily here, the largest responses were from Nebraska, Indiana, South Dakota, and Wisconsin. So 230 that responded. And then tier two, we were able to reach 60 different organizations from eight states. And about half of those were from Ohio. And then we had a mix of other states where we also heard back from people. And what people told us um, from the extension group, about half of that group was providing youth water education, and of the community respondents, about almost all of those people were providing youth water education. 
So probably in a case where an extension educator was not providing it, uh, any kind of education, they did not do the survey. Whereas the community respondents were probably uh, targeted because we knew that they were providing youth water education. So then just to share some basic information about the different programs. So this graph here, these graphs um, show the ages or the grades served by the two different groups. So if we look on the left side, the grades and ages served by extension professionals, we will see here that about 80% indicated that they're providing programming to third through fifth graders. So that was the most common group. And I would say that most of the respondents were providing education to more than one age group. So it might be grades three through five and middle schoolers or middle and high school. So we saw a lot of, a lot of that. But then, so about 80% of third through fifth grade, about 50% um, provided to middle school, about 35% to high schoolers, about 25% um, K through 12 or K through two, and then just a small number indicating preschool age. But if we look at the community partners, we see a little bit different pattern. Again, we do see that the majority of youth water education is from is provided to third through fifth grade at about 80% or a little more, and then middle school about 75% of the programs, the community organizations were providing education to the middle schoolers, um, a little bit less, um, about 65 to 70% to high schoolers, and 50 to 60% from K through second grade. And then we also will see here about 30% indicated that they're doing some kind of education to preschool age children. So then we were wondering where are these youth water education efforts happening? So here we have just a list of different kinds of places that people indicated where they're providing youth water education. So it may be everything from out of school time programs to classrooms in the schools, to community events, to scouting programs, to various kinds of um, certification classes and farmers markets. So a real mix of different locations, um, camps, um, science festivals, and your master gardener, just a real mix. And then I also wanted to point out that there were a couple of community organizations that reported they had water themed internship opportunities for high school age students. So these are just some of the settings. And then I also wanted to touch on curriculum that was used that they reported. And so most common were Project Wet, Project um, Wet Aquatics, uh, Water Rock, Sea Grant, and Water Riches. And then here is a list of all of the different, in alphabetical order, of all of the different kinds of curriculum programs that the organization and extension indicated that they were using. And so some of these programs were um, developed by other organizations and some were developed specifically by the organization or they adapted uh, materials from other programs. So this was a complete list and you'll see that there is you know, quite a number of different, different things, different curriculum that are being used here. So with that, um, I will now turn things over to Susanna to talk about some of the long answers and some of the other interesting things that we learned from our, our work. Great. Thank you, Christy. Yeah, Susanna uh, Bajorova is um, going to be talking next. Uh, Susanna is a research specialist with the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering at Ohio State University and also the Associate Director of the Ohio Water Resources Center. So her bio is on the screen there. And uh, Susanna, take it away. Oops, 
Susanna, uh, we're not hearing you. I don't know if you have yourself. Okay, I didn't have my audio on. I'm sorry. Ah, there we go. Perfect. <laughs> Thank you for the introduction. I am presenting the third part, the open-ended questions on the behalf of the whole team. We all worked on it and basically coded it together, these questions. I just want to emphasize before I start that the goal was, although I will be talking a little bit about the differences between the tier one and tier two, it wasn't really goal of our study to identify those differences. So. Uh, some of our experimental design just wasn't set up for that. So I will start. One of the question was, is there a particular part of your program that makes youth excited about water education? And probably not surprisingly, uh, the experiential part of the education got the most responses. And if I talk experiential, I mean most of the responses was hands-on activities or hands-on learning. Um, sometimes people were citing certain tools like en Enviroscape or stream table, uh, pH testing and other tools. And that's probably not surprising, right? But we also teased out this, uh, the second category is, is experiential with water access. And we teased it out because those answers specifically mentioned that getting into the stream or getting basically these feet wet experiences in creek or you know having the deep nets were very important and i will talk about it a little bit later as well the third theme which um, a lot of respondents mentioned was this place-based learning so that's basically if the ideas were taught and applied to a specific location example of an answer would be relating the lecture to local dam, for example. And then someone somewhat related is application, what made youth excited, right? So if it was, for example, applied to the learning was then applied to some community um, service. So for example, stream cleanups. So making it matter to the lives of learners. And then small little part was uh, when they made this competition. So these were the most, um, these were the themes which emerged in these questions. When we looked uh, the same question, when we were looking at extension and outside partners responses, the general hands-on was indicated by 60% of the ex uh, extension responses. And the outside partners only indicated at 33% because 36% they indicated this experiment experiential with water access. And that's, uh, that's why it seems like the outside partner survey tended to do a little bit more out of classroom setting water education. And I'm showing it because that also later appears in the questions of barriers, for example. So that's why I'm emphasizing it here. We are really not, um, there is also a distinction that the extension educators were emphasizing this place-based learning, which was a little bit less emphasized in the outside partners. And it has to also do probably with the outside partners are a lot of them are nature centers and parks. So they probably do a lot of also after school programs. So they have this, uh, you know, going into the stream kind of uh, type of education. So I'm going to move to the next open-ended question. And that was, uh, this doesn't appear like it appeared on my computer. So sorry about that. But it's, um, what are the barriers to conducting youth water education? So again, not very surprising answers. The most common cited barrier was time. And then if you combine the, as a barrier, the time, money, and personal, you will have uh, more than 50% of responses. This is very consistent with any STEM or science education. Basically, time is one of the most common logistical barrier or personal or money as a resources, lack of them actually. And that's understandable. We cannot expect uh, one educator, even if it's extension personnel in a county, cannot go to every classroom. The other interesting barrier was the school barriers, and that mostly appeared with the tier two 
responses. And these are external barrier and the so about 30% of tier two responses were connected to school barriers and around 17% of tier one. That's the extension educators. So some of the answers here were school busing, uh, then it was also busy school schedules, and some of it was also class sizes. When we talk about hands-on education, class size matter, and that was cited as a barrier. And then the other barriers are, there was really few as an educator interest, and you can see that not every educator has direct interest in water education. A little bit more appeared in the extension answers, uh, and I think because their um, focus is uh, slightly different than water, but we targeted the outside partners as they're uh, doing water education. And then there was some support for the program, like anti-science, atmosphere, and employer priorities were also cited. Uh, one last one barrier was material and information, which I didn't mention. And that was usually uh, people were basically uh, saying they don't have, for example, curriculum or equipment. Uh, they don't know, they don't, lack of resources that are hands on. Um, so this, I feel like this is something which can be developed or which maybe exists. I'm moving, I have a few more questions. One of them is when you look at your youth water education program, what pieces are missing? And here you have again the teams identified and the, and the number of responses. So the pieces missing were, one of them was program elements. We put answers into this team if it contained basically specific curricula or specific program content is missing. Uh, oftentimes, again, it had to do with hands-on content. Uh, and then uh, educators usually said that they want more hands-on activities. And sometimes it was hands-on curriculum that it's related to state standards. And this is, again, pretty uh, known that the connection to standards can be sometimes barrier to implementing education in school setting. And I will a little bit talk about the standards next slide. Other element which was piece was missing was this comprehensiveness. Uh, so basically, the answers which we put into these teams were which had to do with the yearly delivery of the program. And then also with uh, talking about that the program is basically delivered only to, for example, one age group and they would like to expand it. Uh, there was, um, together with the comprehensiveness and funding and sustainability, it seemed like a lot of the water educational program are very ad hoc, um, not fully flushed programs. And I think especially in the extension settings, when people compare it to 4 age curricula, it can basically feel very disorganized, the youth water education. And then the other two teams which were as missing identified was the collaboration partnership that was uh, interesting from my point of view. Uh, they were basically, respondents were saying that they missed this um, additional service learning after school programs, basically follow through after the classroom setting. And then some of the materials and information, if it was just uh, training or supporting information missing, we put it into this category. So for example, unbiased information about rural water was one of the answers. So I feel like some of these as program elements and material and information can be, we can improve on it. There is quite a lot of material developed. And I think if we share the information, this can be a little bit improved on. Uh, I a little bit talked about the standards. We also ask in our survey, this is not open-ended question, I know. But we ask, in your opinion, how important are education standards when offering uh, programs in classroom settings? And as you can imagine, most of the respondents gave it uh, at least five importance or even the highest importance. That's a little bit tricky, and we all know that it's not easy to connect um, education to standards because they, uh, they are changing, the state standards are changing. And also it's very laborious and just takes very long time to do. 
but there is more and more research into improving more automatize more this connection to state or national standards. And then we also ask for examples, just to end on the high note, of you being positively impacted from the water education program. And there is a lot of uh, positive impact. Uh, so some of, uh, some of the programs are doing evaluation of their programming. Some of, the, some of these answers are just observation of the educator, but generally ed educators saw basically knowledge or some type of awareness gained during the process. So there is examples of some responses. For example, you have told us about practices they have implemented to conserve more water. So that's the knowledge gain. Uh, people also measured uh, of course, the significantly higher levels of academic engagement after their program. So that's the evaluation. And then also they observe or measured some continued exploration or ripple effects. So for example, students came back to them talking about the internship they took or their career paths, how it changed uh, the program, their career path, and then they continued to university in that environmental field or water field. And then also kids tell stories. There was a lot of uh, examples where kids were telling and educating their parents. And then we already talked about the youth excitement that's always rewarding for educators. And also community service. Some of the youth started some type of uh, service in the community. Like uh, there is example of youth adopting a stream cleanup. So last but not least, not open-ended question, we ask if, uh, educators observe youth becoming involved in the community. And we also, we actually had in tier two, we had a, uh, in the tier one, there was a little bit less uh, positive responses. Yes, in the tier two, around 50% of the educators observe youth than being involved in the education. So I will actually give the word back to Justin because he will wrap it up and with conclusions. Thanks, Susanna and Christy. Uh, this has been a really uh, great project and um, just truly a, a ton of data generated from it. Um, some of the conclusions we have drawn in our first round of analysis and are submitting, submitting in a paper for publication here shortly um, are along these lines. You know, we learned that, you know, should, as we would expect, um, this is important to a wide array of educators, um, both in and out of extension, and of course ac across a wide geography. Um, I, and so that conclusion seems pretty obvious, but I think as a result of this uh, um, gap analysis that we're better able to describe um, who it is, who's out there doing it, what the needs are. And I think that that's a real um, important conclusion if we're going to move forward with intention uh, seeking funding. Um, the other conclusion that you see here uh, is is about barriers, which again, I think many of us could probably have guessed uh, these answers, but again, having the data behind it is pretty important. And that's, of course, time and funding and comprehensive resources. Um, so um, uh, to close down here, um, we intend to use this data to create awareness about what is out there uh, so that we don't duplicate services um, uh, over the top of one another or and or learn from um, successes. And um, lastly, um, you know, these needs um, really can be partially met through some partnership that's happening out there. So um, I think with that, um, this goes back to Anne, I believe, um, and I think we have our question and answer session. Yeah, perfect. Thank you, Justin and uh, Zuzana and Christy. Um, yes, so please, uh, if you have questions for our speakers about the needs assessment, please put them in the chat box. I see we have one question here from Grace. Uh, she's asking, what do you think this needs assessment tells us about extension youth educators compared to those external youth educators? 
uh, Susanna, I know you touched on this a little bit and said it wasn't, that actually wasn't your core research question in this, but uh, I don't know if you have more, more to add a little bit about the, some of the differences between those two audiences that you talked about in tier one and tier two. I'm not, I am not, I think I already addressed some of those differences. Um, as I said before, we didn't really try to tease that out. So our questions weren't put in that way so we could tease it exactly out. We can then compare some of the answers and guess, as I said, for example, that the extension educator seems to be engaging more in classroom setting than the outside partners, for example. Uh, I don't know if there is something what Justin or Christy wants to add. There's also the difference in the ages served. So that was one area where we took a look at where there's some differences. For me also from the responses, I really felt that the extension partners tend to uh, compare the youth education. I know they do it part of the 4-H, but um, if they are comparing it to the 4 age system, it seemed that they felt it's um, kind of less structured. Well, okay, great. Thank you. I have a question here from Morgan. Uh, once you have cataloged resources, how do you intend to actively get them into the hands of teachers to use? Um, encourage gap analysis, um, et cetera. What is the team thinking about that? I will start, but please again <laughs> join me in this. Uh, so in Ohio, for example, we we have those listservs, so we can uh, we can send and publish those. But we also work with the Ohio Environmental Protection Fund. They do uh, Ohio Environmental Education, uh, Ohio EPA Envi Environmental Education. Sorry, and they and they will help us distribute it as well. Those resources. So I think this webinar is really a great first step towards that. And with us finishing our analyses, we're preparing a paper, we're hoping to give some other talks, and then reconnecting with all of the members on our team to be able to work within each of our states and looking at resources, uh, listservs, uh, opportunities for presentations, for just getting information out about what we've learned from this and hopefully getting more dialogue and sharing of resources happening as a result of some of the work. Yeah, absolutely. Great point, Christy. And I know um, uh, we've been in touch, this project has with, you know, 4-H program leaders in each state. So that could be an avenue for communicating that as well as I'm sure uh, speaking on behalf of the North Central Region Water Network that uh, once the you know papers out and results are finalized. We we'll want to put some of these results on our website as well. Um, so those are just some of the ways that you're uh, starting to to think about getting that word out. But that's definitely a great point, Morgan. Uh, we have a question from Hannah, uh, which I think is a, a good point that a lot of educators might be facing. So Hannah says she serves 39 member local governments across Central and Eastern North Carolina. What are the ways I can still provide place-based education across such a wide ge geography? Um, did you, did the team face any um, responses in the survey that maybe address these, you know, geographical constraints? I, I'm not sure we had any question and maybe Christy can help uh, with the Definitely not in the open-ended question about geographical constraints. Uh, I don't think we had questions in the other part about geographical constraints because it was usually um, focused on people which work in the counties, kind of more local, localized agencies. I know that the Project WET is trying to deal with geographical constraints that are trying to educate teachers in the youth education and then hope that the teachers will bring it to kind of the place based um, you know location yeah i don't recall seeing many responses really if any 
that we're addressing this issue that was just raised about geographical constraints. So I'm not sure if we can really speak to that from this, but we can certainly think about other ideas of ways to reach broader groups. I think also maybe because the people who were part of this study probably dealt more locally with whatever youth water education they were providing rather than across a larger district or even statewide. Yeah, and I uh, would chime in on that, um, on Hannah's question there, um, you know, just to advocate for lo looking at watershed level edu education uh, to define common areas of interest and um, I don't uh, deeply know or understand the watersheds of Central and Eastern North Carolina, but um, if I were to be looking at an issue like that, um, I think um, I've seen some projects around the nation that look at large watersheds as defined um, commonalities for a place-based approach to educating about water. Um, you know, those, you know, I know the stuff in the Chesapeake Bay is really, um, along those lines, and there's many other examples around the country that um, have lo looked at it in, in kind of that way. And the other, I think, of course, it, you know, along the lines of a status and needs um, survey or a gap analysis is just getting to the, you know, list of two or three key um, current uh, environmental issues. Um, you know, is it aquatic and they, invasive species, is it water quality or qu water quantity, or is it harmful algal blooms? I think those have a context within place, um, both in their origination as an issue and ultimately in their solution as an issue. Um, so those would be a couple of the ideas I would have there. But as Susanna said, um, we didn't um, really get much information specific like that in our um, in this project, but those are ones that I know about around the country that I think are pretty successful. Great, thanks. Uh, we have a question here from John. Uh, John notes that he would like to put together an initiative to leverage a new reservoir that is being constructed in the area where he lives. The engineering company has agreed to supply shape files and drawing files. They will also work with him to set up an on-site place for working with youth. He is looking for ideas to uh, for different age groups from elementary through undergrad and is looking for thoughts. Uh, he's a contractor, JS manager, and not instructor. So um, seeing this as a, as a unique opportunity. I don't know if uh, Justin or Christy have any thoughts, though I do know one thing I think is interesting about this team is that not everyone in this team is, you know, actively, um, you know, 100% focused on youth education. As you said, you're not an instructor. Um, I know Zuzana and I have had conversations about, you know, your educational background being in the hard sciences and not necessarily in, in the youth education realm, but still using this as an opportunity to look at how to engage youth. Yeah, what comes to mind from John's question there um, is looking at um, story maps, which is a ESRI uh, product that, that's been in development for quite some time. And I think is really at a level now um, where it's converged with ease of use and being a refined product and also with for a you know, mobile processing power on a you know a tablet or phone with a, a Wi-Fi connection or cellular connection. Those things are have started to converge in a way that um, you know just looking at this five years ago wouldn't have been as compelling. But um, I believe now um, they really, really are robust. So I'd look at story maps um, through S3, and that's that's a way that images, and particularly because you have a, a project underway that it begins to be its own narrative as things are being developed or changing uh, through the construction or um, being monitored or evaluated afterwards. I think the storyline for a specific place like that can be captured well through image as well as um, data points that are uh, collected um, on site or be available for someone if they were to 
come to that site even if you weren't there. Um, it's ac accessible that way too. I feel like what I learned from this survey as well was that uh, collaboration is crucial. I think we would um, communicate much better as a youth education. There was so many resources I didn't know about, for example, just from the curriculum point of view. So I think if you can, uh, I don't know if the Water Resources Center Research Institute can help you in Missouri to connect to someone who does this type of education and do it with you. I'm sure there will be people at university interested in collaborating. Yeah, I think that was a question maybe we should have asked in more detail on the survey now looking back and to think about, you know, some of the barriers and some of the gaps and some of the problems that people were having and if there could be more collaboration and networking among people doing this kind of work and maybe that would help alleviate some of the issues that people are having, but we didn't explore that deeply enough in this in this study. Yeah, that's a great point. I know you did ask about uh, partnerships, I believe, right? And one of them was, you know, partnerships or needing to have more partnerships. That was definitely mm -hmm. something heard from outside partners, so that makes a lot mm -hmm. of sense. Um, it looks like we have a message from Janine, who uh, would like to be involved in the project moving forward. She's with, at least that's how I'm interpreting this comment, she's with the Minnesota Project WET. Um, and Janine, we actually have the contact information for all three of our speakers on the screen here today, so feel free to reach out to them. Um, they might be willing to uh, share a copy of the, the survey or at least talk to you a little bit more about the results. Certainly uh, share the journal article once uh, that is um, finalized. Um, but we wanted to make sure and have that information available to you and you also see here about the webinar being saved. So just as a reminder that the webinar will be, this webinar is being recorded and will be posted on the North Central Region Water Network website and our media archive as well as learn.eextension.org. Uh, Janice has a note that it might be helpful for John and others. Uh, there is a resource for using research-based best practices to develop education efforts for youth and adult education. And she provides a link there. It looks like this is a resource coming out of the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. Thanks for sharing that, Janice. Um, I see uh, Janine is, is typing and I'll uh, leave uh, maybe ask a question of my own while we wait to see if any other final questions trickle in um, from folks before we uh, end today. So um, just a question uh, for me. So I, uh, I, you know, we obviously work for the North Central Region Water Network and work a lot with uh, water, but not necessarily with youth water education specifically. I'm curious how many of those curriculum that was collected were really familiar to you or how many that you felt like were um, ones that you hadn't seen before? Are these really the curriculum you expected to see or was there in, any in there that you really hadn't heard of? And that might differ for each person being, you know, state by state, I don't know. So certainly some of those I was familiar with, like Project WET and um, Sea Grant, and but there were many that I had not encountered before, but I, it, it, I have not been doing youth water education programming, so uh, a lot of these I may not have encountered just because I, I'm not directly in that kind of work. So I'd actually be interested in hearing from others too if um, they ones that they're familiar with and ones that were new. Uh, hi, this is Justin. I, you know, I, you learn something new every day, right? Um, and this is, you know, an opportunity to see um, some additional resources out there. Um, you know, I don't, I, I put the number around 25% or so were, you know, uh, new new to me and at least in some conversational level. Um, um, you know, there's a lot of stuff out there that gets kind of, um, repurposed or resurfaced in a um, um, in a local way, and so there's, I think there's a fair bit of that, and I think that's good. Um, and then there's also some name brand stuff out there that, um, of course, has some pretty wide recognition either as a published work or as an extension product or, or you know, like 
Project Wet, for example. That's just my my opinion. Great, thank you. Uh, we have another note from Janine uh, that FYI Project Wet is changing its name nationally in the near future, and a huge climate change initiative is being rolled out. So that is good to know, Janine. I I personally did not know that, but I bet I'm curious about some of the folks on our Youth Watch Education team may be more plugged in and aware of that. Uh, looks like we also have a question from Emily Jones. Did this survey provide any insights into the specific content focus of the existing programs? For example, aquatic organisms, water chemistry, water infrastructure, stewardship, et cetera. Uh, she works at a wastewater treatment plant that wants to extend its educational programming, and they're particularly interested in subject matter gaps in water education uh, that the program might be able to fill. So I just will chime in here. I, I'm not sure we we ask about specific content, but from the ends first about, uh, you know, what makes youth excited. And it's clear that people use a lot of aquatic organisms because that makes you very excited. So there is a lot of uh, doing macro invertebrates and other testing. And there is so a lot with organisms. And then there is also a lot of work with the different models like Enviroscape and groundwater models. So that's just what I observed. Okay. Great. Not see much. Sorry, we did not see much about water infrastructure, but that might be a little bit biased by the people we asked. Uh, basically, about the youth water education, and I think a lot of nature centers or, uh, you know, even soil and water conservation districts don't do much uh, infrastructure, water infrastructure education. Right, so uh, perhaps in more rural areas, there might be more of a, a cover, a concentration on non-point source pollution and topics like that, as opposed to water infrastructure. If I'm understanding you correctly, Susanna. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, Janice also notes that there was a research project that reviewed over 200 curriculum. So maybe getting into a little bit more of that question of content, which Emily and Holly are asking about, um, that the information is dated, but there is a list of details. Um, so she's passing that along from, and again, this looks like a resource from the University of Wisconsin-Madison Division of Extension. All right, perfect. Well, uh, thank you very much for the discussion today and for everyone's questions. It is right around three o'clock. So um, we will uh, close today's session and thank you especially to our speakers, to Justin, Christy, and Zuzana for talking about their um, study. And please be sure to check back in with the North Central Region Water Network um, for additional information and results from their study as we will for sure share their uh, journal article when that is out, um, as well as post the recording of this webinar. Um, we also uh, want to let you know about an upcoming webinar that we have. This is actually hosted by our climate team. Um, so today you heard from our youth water education team, but our climate team is going to be hosting a webinar on Monday, February 24th at 1 o'clock p.m. talking about the Missouri River Basin Spring Flooding Outlook. No flooding is a lot of top of mind for a lot of folks. There's a registration link on the, web on the screen here for you. So thank you, everyone, and have a great day.